Crystal Duffy, a 37-year-old former Southern California high school choir director and author who recently resigned from her job, sold her home, and moved with her young son and husband to Iowa to farm. Welcome, Crystal. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, you guys. Oh, this is so great to catch up with you. We intervie interviewed you back in the summer of uh, 2020. That's episode 123, which we will link to in the show notes. In it, you shared your plans to retire to Iowa sooner rather than later. A lot of people talk about making a big life change, but you did it. Walk us through the decision to leave teaching and California and move to Iowa. Um. Well, for me, it was an easy decision because I wanted to grow a lot of vegetables and I wanted to have a lot of space and I just simply couldn't afford that in California. So that made it really simple. Um, and even if I could have afforded it between the perpetual drought and the, the soil not being super fertile <laughs> in the area I lived in, um, it just really probably wasn't a smart place to try and grow a bunch of produce. So um, I came on a road trip to this area in Northeast Iowa uh, seven years ago and was just um, struck by how beautiful it was. The soil's really fertile. There's a farming community here um, and it's also a college town where I live. So it's kind of an interesting blend of people. Um, and when I heard what the prices were for properties out here, that just like my brain just started doing some math. So um, I've been planning it for about seven years. So. so you lived in Southern California, San Bernardino County, not far where, from where Scott and I live, uh, closer to where I live in Redlands. And you sold your house, I think, at a fantastic time this summer. How hard or how easy? <laughs> look at you. Look at the giggling. That's all, I love it. How I'm guessing, okay, it's the, uh, what would that be? The, the former. How easy was it to sell your house? Okay, yeah. So when I did my original like early retirement math, um, I did it. I did intentionally sort of like lowballed how much I thought I could sell my house for because I like to be careful, you know. So like I thought I would sell my house for 150 grand less than what I ended up selling it for. So that obviously made things like the decision. I actually retired a year earlier than I was planning on, and we can talk about that later. But um. So, but that didn't really matter when I had that extra buffer that I wasn't planning on getting. Um, so we actually only showed the house one weekend. It was Mother's Day weekend. We had like 13 showings on Saturday and like four showings on Mother's Day. And we had six offers um, all over asking. Uh, the, what sucked though was like the first three all fell through. Like they just disappeared off the face of the planet. I don't know if maybe they got another offer on another house and that was accepted before we got back to them. So, um, so the highest offers all fell through, but it's fine. So um, yeah, so it's, it, it was pretty easy to sell and quick escrow and yeah. <laughs> and you had been to the area in Iowa before, fell in Many love times. with it. And so yeah. you, you had been communicating with a realtor. So did you buy a house there before you sold or were you sort of just ready to go once you did sell? I was in contract before we were in escrow. So sorry, I was in contract on the house in Iowa before we were in escrow on the house in California. There's no escrow in Iowa. So like you literally just say like, I'd like to buy your house. And they say, <laughs> okay. And then you sign a piece of paper and you're in contract. And I made a cash offer because of selling in California and how the huge price difference. My house here was way cheaper. Um, so I made a cash offer. So they were like, okay. And then like, when I had the cash, I gave it to them. And then it was my house. Like it's oh. that simple here. It's wow. kind of like ridiculous. How I kept texting my realtor in Iowa. Like I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, is there some more paperwork? How much is this going to cost? Oh my gosh, this is going to make you so angry. So to file like with the County, the deed and everything, it was like $17. <laughs> and then I paid a hundred dollars to a lawyer for a title opinion, like to make sure the title is clean and that's it. And, but the, the downside was you actually had to rent a van to put all the cash in to deliver the actual cash, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just did a wire. I mean, it was so easy. You, um, so, yeah, instead of having the escrow account, you just wired the money to the uh, lawyer. 
So the lawyer has like kind of like a holding account. They that's how they do it here. And so you send them the money, and then the lawyer gives the cuts the check to the um, to the realtors and to the owners. I have to believe you're a bit of an outlier because you hear like I read in the LA Times about the backlash to Californians moving to Boise. I, you know, that's an area Scott's looked at and I sent him that article, you know, don't California, Kate, Boise and Idaho and even Texas, you hear there's sort of a little bit, I, I don't think it's nearly as strong as it is in places like Idaho, but I have to think you're a bit of an outlier you know, I wonder if you have a reputation that are all, oh, this rich Californian has moved into the area. Have you heard anything like that? Have you met any other California expats? Um, the, the, I, there's a California expat I work with, but he's been here like 20 years. So I don't think at this point he considers himself a Californian. Um, no, I'm sure we're, I mean, like we'll always be outsiders because literally everyone in our neighborhood is related. Like, <laughs> And the people that aren't related by blood, it's like someone's ex-wife lives across the street from someone's brother. Like everybody's related. They have a family cemetery at the top of our road and then an old like one room schoolhouse they all went to. Oh my like, goodness. So we're already sort of like the odd people out. Um, and then being from California, um, but the, the Iowans are so nice that like you would never know. Like I know, cause I did some research before coming here and like, I knew that like we would be outsiders, but like I am anywhere I go. I'm weird everywhere I am. So it's just being weird somewhere else. And they've been super nice. <laughs> Our neighbors, like every single neighbor we have has brought us either produce or baked goods. Like, it's amazing. Like we, the first couple of weeks we were here, we had like brownies every day. We've had fresh eggs, jal jalapenos, potatoes, you know, like cucumbers, tomatoes. Like, it's so cool. So uh, fresh maple syrup. One of our neighbors is actually oh, like wow. the oldest, the oldest running maple syrup, like farm in the whole state or something or yeah. People don't eat or use real syrup we we don't buy syrup at the grocery store we don't no. buy maple syrup we buy something no. that says syrup but it's not actual yeah. maple syrup. syrup yeah no. that yeah. is so wild my um uh, so i had the opportunity about a week and a half ago my uh or about two weeks ago my my father grew up on a farm in, in salem oregon and i had the opportunity to visit his nephew's uh farm um out in the middle of wine country, they now they now grow grapes, and I just kind of loved being out there. Uh, it was just such a change of pace from the density and the hustle and the bustle, and just it was. I was like, man, I could kind of see myself here for for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but what was so? I mean, you you you're there now. Um, Things are, you're still weird there. I think it's mm -hmm. funny, by the way, that you're weird in California. If you're weird in California, yeah. then yeah. you've accomplished something. So what's been the biggest challenge of, of uh, so far being there where you're at in Iowa? Um, I think it, the, the biggest challenge for us is just like been like getting my son to adjust because he's three. And so I, I imagine like, it's really like, they don't understand. Like we moved across the entire country um I thought he would like love the yard like we have seven and a half acres and then we oh. back up to we back up to 40 acres of timber woods oh. that we yeah we've met the owner and he is like yeah go walk around my property and so there's like these paths that have been mowed through the 40 acres so you can just walk through and there's mushrooms everywhere it's like a fantasy um, world I want to see kid... pictures Crystal I want to oh, see yeah, pictures I'll, I'll, I'll send some my kid goes outside for like five minutes and then he's like, I'm bored. Like he doesn't even like the yard. And I'm like, no, how do you not like, so we bought him a bike and that's helped, but the weather has been beautiful. So it hasn't even, I'm like, we need to be outside now before winter is coming like for real here. But so it's been hard and he didn't have a bedroom. So we actually bought a one, a one bedroom house. And because we knew that we could convert an area in the basement to a bedroom. So we've been trying to build that, but we didn't have any of our tools because the movers hadn't delivered anything. And so just sort of like getting him settled in his space and we've been kind of on top of each other. It's a very small house. Um, yeah. And then getting a new routine going, like I'm a very routine person. 
a lot of your routine though has to do with your physical surroundings, right? So my house is entirely different. Everything is entirely different. Grocery shopping is entirely different. You know, like it's good, but um, as a creature of habit, it's been, I just feel off sometimes, but I'm more in, I have a lot of routines going now between all the activities and things I'm doing. So it's sort of like when you fill in those gaps, um, it helps like figure out, yeah, good routines. I have a list of questions for you, but I'm just gonna get, go completely off script just because cool. now I'm interested. I, I think all of our listeners right now are wanting to know one thing. Yeah. What are these vegetables that you had to move to Iowa? <laughs> plant? What are Pot these farm. vegetables? Well, oh no, pot's illegal here. Medicinally bizarre, but in many Minnesota it's legal, I think. So, and I'm right by the border. Um, I actually go grocery shopping in Minnesota and Wisconsin, not to get off topic, but anyway. Um, I, well, I just wanted to grow everything. Basically. I had a track house in California with like a corner lot. So I had about, I think I had like 14 raised beds. So I did grow a lot of ah, stuff, okay. but it took years to like build up the soil. I had to compost so much. And then it was really windy where I lived and I would lose like several inches of soil every year from the winds. I've multiple times lost entire gardens to the wind. We would get like 90 mile an hour wind gusts. So we were at the bottom of a mountain pass. Like the last year I, I grew stuff there. I had these six foot tall tomatillo plants like loaded with tomatillos that were gonna be ripe in like two weeks. Windstorm, every single tomatillo was ripped off the plant. Uh. So it just wasn't a great place to grow. So I'm planning on growing everything. First, I am planning though on finding all the wild asparagus that grows out here because I love asparagus. Um, I'm also, we've probably got 10 to 15 kinds of edible mushrooms in our timber and I've like identified several of them. Um, we've got, I have, we have wild black raspberries that literally take up five acres of our property. We have several mulberry trees. We've got walnut trees. So just like scavenging in it, like I could live off of my property right now without even planting a garden, not to mention the deer that hang out in our backyard and we have water supply. So that in and of itself is really cool. Um, but I'm, I've already like mapped out vegetable garden and, uh, I'm going to grow everything. Like everything, everything grows here. Like all of the people I've met, all of my coworkers, I got a part-time job and we can talk about that later. If you throw it in the ground, it will grow. Like it is amazing. The soil here is so crazy. I, I got to jump in That's... real quick, Scott. Did, did, um, Crystal just admit they might shoot deer? Oh, I didn't if catch they I didn't my catch garden. That. If they oh. eat my garden. Right now, I think they're really beautiful and I'm not actually a hunter, but we'll see what happens if they do my garden. <laughs> so they just, as long as they don't cross that line, don't, don't mess with Crystal. She'll... <laughs> the first thing we're doing is building deer fencing, actually, before anything else happens. So it's... I have to figure out where the garden wants, is going to go and then build the fencing. It's funny you mentioned that because one of my uh, former clients and actually my son's, uh, one of my son's principals like 15 years ago, uh, she moved to an area of Colorado and the deer are driving her nuts coming oh, yeah. into her garden yeah. and she's tried nets and all sorts of stuff. It's not working. So Eight uh, feet hopefully, fencing. okay, good. Eight feet fencing, you know, wild blackberries, walnuts, timber and much. This sounds like where I grew up. I used to like pick wild black, uh, blackberries. I used to, um, you know, we used to have walnut trees like this actually, Dan, maybe I have, maybe I have found the place that uh... I was thinking that, that was going to be one I of my follow-up. Apples. We have <laughs> apple trees too. We have four uh, apple trees. Crystal, keep your eye on a place for Scott. Um... Okay. <laughs> I'll do what? That. Okay. So you mentioned a part-time job, but before yeah. we get there, I feel like there need, there's a dog that's going to pop up at some point. Are, are you guys getting a dog? Are you looking at getting a dog? Or is there's, there's no dog in the future for you guys? Have, it just feels like there should be a dog in this. Oh, like a farm dog. Yeah, like a farm like dog. Like a real dog, because I actually have a pug. But he <laughs> he's like less useful than the cats are. Actually, one of our cats has been catching mice already. It's been awesome. No, my husband wants a full-size dog eventually, but I think that that'll, that'll wait. We want to get chickens and goats and stuff probably first. So okay. I want to put a, right. I put a pitch in for an Australian shepherd. They are the best. That's dogs. what my husband wants. They are so well behaved. They're so They're smart. They're really active though. Loving. Yeah. The first few years, a hundred percent, but how great for a Australian shepherd to grow up on a piece of property. That mm -hmm. would be amazing for that dog. It would be cool. I 
That would be a neat. Okay. You mentioned a part-time job. Yeah. Tell us about it. Okay. So, uh, because I'm kind of a busy body and I also wanted to get out of the house, um, a little bit to like get away from my insane child for a bit. Um, so I was going to volunteer for a nonprofit when I came out here and then they had a job opening and I was like, oh. well, why would I volunteer when they could pay me to do what I wanted to do? So I realized too, that a lot of the stuff I had wanted to do when I was volunteering, volunteers might not be able to do. So I really wanted to be like processing seeds and packaging seeds and stuff like that. And you don't necessarily let volunteers into those areas. And I wanted to be in the field, like working on the crops. Um, so literally this job opened that was when I was still in California, it's three days a week. So it was part-time. So I was like, okay, because I have zero interest in working five days a week, especially after having worked part-time now to see like that difference. Um, and it was a, like a, a 50, 50 job. So half of it is working in the field, like planting, tending and harvesting crops. And then half of it is working in the seed house, packaging seeds, processing seeds, like, um, organizing seeds. And I was like, that's exactly what I wanted to do all in one position. And so, yeah, so I applied for it and I got the job. Um, and it's like summer camp. I mean, it's, it's not summery anymore so much, but, um, I play in dirt all day and like harvest beans and like, it's so cool. And then starting in November, we go indoors, which I'm sure I'll be thankful for. Um, and then I get to work on packaging seeds and shipping seeds and stuff like that. So, so it's really fun. And then right after I started, we all got a $4 an hour raise. <laughs> I was like, what? Cause like, again, I wasn't doing it for the money. And I was actually kind of impressed with what I was getting paid. Like that's my kid's green. When I was getting paid for Iowa. And then all of a sudden we got this big old raise and I was like, well, cool. <laughs> like, didn't see that coming, but. That's amazing. What has surprised you the most? I know you, you haven't been there that long, but I mean, it's gotta be something. The, the hours that things are open or should I say aren't open. <laughs> yes. So like, <laughs> I, after work one day, wanted to stop by like the, the farm and fleet store to like buy some waterproof boots and they close at five. Like what? <laughs> it's like Thursday afternoon, they close at five or um, some places are only open like Thursday through Saturday. Nothing's open on Sunday. Um, so yeah, not like we literally, every time we wanted to do something, no matter what time it is, no matter what day it is, we always have to like look up the hours because we've been burned like many times at this point because things are just not open. <laughs> so I guess this ties into my next question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that winter is coming. Are you ready for winter? Almost. Um, as ready as we can be, the unfortunate thing is like your firewood needs to, you know, you want like seasoned firewood. So like we're chopping wood and stuff right now, but it's for next winter. So mm -hmm. we did, I did learn from um, one of my coworkers that upright trees where the bark has fallen off are dead, but just haven't fallen over yet. And they should be dry enough. And we actually did find a few, we have tons of trees. So we have found several trees that we can use for this year. But I mean, you have to like, we got a chainsaw and we got a, um, a log splitter. Like we have all that, but it just takes time, you know, and it's, it's hard work, um, it's tiring. So you can only do so much. Um, so we are not gonna have enough wood for this winter, but we do have like propane and a furnace, but we have this beautiful wood burning stove that was hooked into the ductwork. So we're, we're really excited about using that, you know, next winter, like all the time. But this winter we, we were not quite we don't have enough time. Um, and we're, I'm literally like, after we're done, I'm going shopping for actual clothing. Yeah. That seems like, uh, are you excited I, to yeah. like, get, kind of get new, like, I mean, like we do not have winter clothes here in California. No, no. <laughs> like I made, so I, you know, I did asked a lot of my coworkers and most, most of the people who were from this area. And then I looked online, like, what do we even need? Like, I didn't even know what we needed. And I came up with this grid and was like, you know, what do I have? What does my husband have? What does my son have? And like, basically nothing, you know? So um, some of our friends actually like crocheted us some like hats and scarves and stuff before we left, which is awesome. So and some of my coworkers bought me like gloves and really thick wool socks. So we had a couple things, but yeah, no, we, we need like winter, we need like snow boots. I need waterproof boots for work. We need muck boots, like rubber boots, you know, rain, rain boots. We need actual jackets. We need, you know, long johns, which we had some of that stuff from camping in Yosemite in winter. So that's cool. But 
it's a lot of gear. Like we're gonna have to spend some money. Luckily your house sold for more than you expected. Right. Well, uh, luckily I'm going to the thrift stores first. So <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> All right. You know, I have several questions, but one just jumped to my mind that I want to ask first. Crystal, can you talk about, because a lot of people out there are in the fire movement, financially independent, retired early. They want to, they're, they're, they've got a goal that you have. Can you talk about now that you've done this, how um, financially secured do you feel? I, it's so funny. I wasn't ever scared about that aspect of it. Um, it, and which is bizarre because I am a somewhat like rational person. I did a lot of math. I enjoy doing the math. Like I wasn't just like, Oh, let's retire on a whim. Like I've literally been preparing for this for quite some time, but I was never, I did the math and I figured out, I know my expenses, my expensive has, expenses have like not changed. Um, and then I, I buffered obviously and budgeted for things that I haven't paid for before, like health insurance. I have never paid for it because I had a great job. So, you know, and I feel like I over buffered for that. Um, so actually pulling the trigger and doing it, it's weird too, as a teacher, I didn't get paid over summer anyway. So, you know, it sort of just felt like an elongated summer break. Like I already didn't get paid, um, over summer because I only would take 10 paychecks and I would invest, you know, the rest of it myself and something, but, um, so that has like not even, I don't, I don't know if I've processed everything to be honest, but that like, I have not once checked the stock market since I retired. So I know occasionally I'll see something on some Facebook groups, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to pull all my money out. And I'm like, eh. like, I don't even go look, I don't even care. Um, I think having the part-time job, like probably makes that not as much of a worry for me. But the other thing I, I did, like even the, the catastrophic, like, worst case scenario after I fire, if I lose everything, like the stock market collapses, I lose all my investments. I still live in a paid off house. And that was part of my fire plan. It's not part of everyone's fire plan, but my plan was like, my expenses are as low as possible and we have no debt. And so I still live in a paid off house with paid off cars in a low cost of living area where I can grow most of what I need. And I believe we have enough seeds by now after two months of working at a seed place. Um, so, so yeah, I, I just, I think it's, uh, I have a privilege of being young-ish too. So if I had to go back to work, like if I was 70, maybe I wouldn't be all like as confident about it, but I, I'm 0% worried about, about income right now. So in the, <laughs> our podcast with you, which again, we will um, link to in the show notes, you're, you're someone that has a 403B, you have a 457B. At some yes. point, you will draw from a California pension. Yes. And, and I'm guessing you're contributing to Social Security now as part of this job. Yeah. And obviously, First there's some time issues. Ever. Yeah. Because <laughs> again, we should point this out to our listeners about um, a dozen states in the United States, the teachers do not pay into Social Security, and California is one of them. So you've got that going. And also the fact that you got, I would call this a dream job for you. Would you, is that a fair description? Yes, absolutely. And actually, so was my previous job before COVID. Uh, um, but yes, this is literally a dream job for me in a dream location. It is so beautiful. The farm that I work at is so gorgeous. And I thought at first it was just me because I'm new to the area and I'm used to this like arid brown landscape. Yep. Even my colleagues who've, who've lived here their whole lives, we every single day stop and just look at our surroundings. And we're like, oh my gosh, we are so lucky. It is beautiful. And for people who are just picturing flat cornfields, there's rolling hills everywhere and there's bluffs. And it doesn't look like what you think Iowa probably looks like if you're from California. <laughs> well, that this what you described as uh, you know your this this amazing job and location it reminds me of what mr money mustache you know one of the kind of leaders in the the fire movement says is cuz he too was never worried about pursuing this lifestyle he said in fact what happens is new amazing opportunities open up and i think you are living yes. proof and chris of this crystal this is why i was so anxious to to interview you because i think especially now, sadly, so many teachers, you alluded to COVID, have been put through the ringer. I follow a lot of teachers on Twitter and I'm seeing so many statements like, I am not okay. My colleagues are not okay. We are not being supported and nurtured during this time. And so I think there's probably a lot in our audience 
who are thinking along these terms. So it's so nice to meet this, to, to speak with someone who I feel like we know because we've interacted multiple times. Let's go back to teaching. Do you miss anything about teaching? Because it's obviously the beginning of the school year now. It's October when we're interviewing you. And maybe this is something that'll occur down the road. But how do you feel about that aspect? I miss my kids. Um, I think eventually I will probably want to be doing something again in, in a school setting whether it's like in a long-term setting, maybe once my son's like older and screams less and is in school full-time, um, I can see potentially doing like some sort of like educational outreach with the nonprofit I work with or volunteering for another nonprofit, potentially, you know, giving presentations in schools. Like I, I do miss that interaction. Um, I'm a really honest person and so are teenagers. And so it just like, I don't know, I just sort of miss that. Like, it's like a breath of fresh air sometimes like you always know what you're getting. Like, you know, you never know what you're gonna get day to day, but like, I don't know. I just, I do miss working with kids. Um, I don't necessarily miss the job because it wasn't what it used to be. So through no fault of the school I worked at either. Like it literally was COVID that like killed my job for me, so. And you probably would have maybe delayed this move by a year. So maybe for Just you, one turned, year. <laughs> and maybe for you, it's turned out to be a good thing, right? You sold your house at such a good time. It sounds like you bought yeah. at a really good time. There was this job opening. It's interesting how the universe can open up. Um, yeah. I have a feeling you've already answered the next question. Um, do you miss Southern California? I miss in and out um, <laughs> and Chinese dumplings and Thai food. Ooh, a lot of Thai, good Thai food here. Yeah. I thought I would miss the mountains. However, what I didn't realize is that when you live in a valley, like what I didn't realize is how much like sky there is out there and stuff to see. So our house is actually at the top of a hill. And because there's no mountains that are taller, like we can see for like miles. It's so cool. So, um, so I don't miss the mountains. I thought I would. I thought it was like mountains in and out. Um, you know, I miss my family, um, but my mom's already come to visit and I'm sure the rest of some of my family will probably come visit. Um, but yeah, mostly just the food. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're not far. <laughs> you said you're close to Minnesota. I don't know how far you are to Minneapolis, but I have to say when I visited there, that is just such a great food city. Oh yeah. I'm um, three hours. Um, That's not crazy. Which is but it's like three hours on like this beautiful two lane road driving through farms. You know what I mean? Like, so um, I just listen to books on tape and I'm good. I, it's our closest airport, like major airport. Oh, so okay. I've actually, I'm driving there tomorrow. Actually, I go there a lot. Um, so um, I went to a Himalayan restaurant the last time I went. It was really good. Cool. Um, but yeah, so we have that outlet if we need. And we're not too far from La Crosse, Wisconsin um, is a bigger place with, you know, okay. more food options. We're not too far from Madison, Wisconsin. We're literally right at the town. corner of the co northeast corner of Iowa. So we're like 20 miles from Minnesota and like 30 miles from Wisconsin. So. Well, you have You're been near, so generous uh, oh. with, with your time. And we're just so appreciative of you um, doing this. I just really have one last question here, um, Crystal. If mm -hmm. you can stick around afterwards, I got a couple of follow-up questions, not for, not for the pod. But what would you tell anyone considering a similar life move? I'm glad you asked that because I was going to like butt in with something that I had that I had thought when we were talking about fire earlier. So I went through a lot of the worst case scenarios, but of course there's like, there's a big difference. There's a lot of gray, right? Between black and white, between like fire is complete success and I've completely failed. And so one of the things I, I thought about too was like, let's say I was wrong in my math or something happens with the stock market that's not happened before. So we can't predict the future and I don't have enough to continue to stay retired. And like, maybe I got a five year sabbatical where I played in the dirt and lived my best life on my farm and spent more time with my son while before he started school and like got to live this dream. And then I had to go back to work again it's still better than the at like what 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 the norm is right so to me there there wasn't really a failure um and while i was in the midst of saving and saving and sometimes for some people i know that can feel like sacrifice it didn't for me but again we've talked about how i'm kind of weird 
in the middle of that, let's say five years into the fire plan, I was like, this sucks. I want to spend my money. I'm finally making decent money. My debt is gone. I could always have just done that. There's, it's not like you make this decision and you can't undo it or you can't go back. So if I was sick of saving and sick of planning, all of a sudden now, like my house was basically paid off. I almost, it was almost paid off. I have a paid off house in Southern California, paid off vehicles, making a decent income, no debt, boo hoo. So what if I don't retire early? So to me, it was like a win, win, win. Like just even five years of that hustling, like what it did for me down the line, you know, is, and I think you're right when you brought up Mr. Money Mustache too. It's about also having the confidence to seek out those opportunities that you might not have sought out because of what they would pay. So like someday, maybe I will work full time again for this nonprofit that I really love making 20 grand a year, but that would be fine because I didn't need to make anything or having that buffer of that money I saved up. Maybe it wasn't enough for a full retirement, but it gives you, it gives you the freedom to make decisions based on what you want to do and not on what you feel you have to do financially. So, wow. I so think yeah, were... go for it. <laughs> I love that. I, I think you're such a role model, Crystal. I've, I was impressed the first, first time I met you. If anybody wanted to reach out with questions, would they be able to do that to you? Or yeah, would you want I'm them to... on... yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I do want them to reach out to me. I'm on Instagram. It's Crystal Parker Duffy. Um, I have a, an author page on Facebook. Um, and so I do respond to messages on both of those. I don't have a Twitter or anything else because I'm not really big on social media, but so yeah, I do have Instagram and Twitter and people actually message me like a lot. And, uh, sometimes they're insurance salesmen and sometimes they're actually asking me for help. And so I, I love that I can forward them. I always forward them to the 403 BYS Facebook group. Um, sometimes they're from California. So I feel like I'm like really able to help and give information. Sometimes they're from like my district. So like, oh, hey, I just heard you retired and you work in my district. So yeah, I love it when people reach out. I think too, sometimes it's easier to reach out. I, uh, it's mostly females that message me. And so maybe it feels more comfortable for females to reach out one-on-one -on -one versus like posting in a Facebook group. You're afraid you're going to ask a stupid question. Although I will say like, everyone's very nice. I'm four or three be wise. So feel free to ask questions. Um, but, uh, yeah, they can totally reach out and it doesn't have to be about teaching stuff or four or three B stuff. It could be, you know, it could be about fire stuff or like farming. No. <laughs> well, Crystal, I am going to literally reach out and order seeds from you because I'm in the process of looking at these galvanized, um, I don't know what you call them, like tubs or planting big, the big planting tubs. I'd like to get several of those in my backyard. So I'll, I will reach out to you to get some, some suggestions on that. Um, and then the, the organization you work for is seedsaver.org. Is that correct? Yeah. Seed savers. Yeah. It's a nonprofit. Oh, plural Ooh, can, seed savers. Okay. Yeah. Seed savers. I can confidently say that they are probably responsible for hundreds, if not thousands of varieties of vegetables being saved from complete extinction. Um, and part of the crew that I work with, we actually um, plant out seeds that we have low stock of, or um, mostly that's what we do. We do other things, but to keep it simple, but we, yeah, we just literally plant out seeds that we have low stock of so we can grow plants and get more seeds to make sure that those plants don't disappear. Um, because with the advent of like big grocery stores and produce that all has to be like the same shape and the same color. And, yeah. um, a lot of like heirloom varieties had gone by the wayside. And so, yeah, so seed savers is doing really great things. And then they also sell seeds as a way to fundraise to, to run the organization, but they're fantastic. And if you want organic heirloom seeds, I highly recommend seed savers. Wow. What a great organization. And I know you feel lucky to work for them, but I would say they should feel lucky to have someone like you working for them. Crystal, it has been an absolute pleasure catching up with you. We will reach out again um, because I just, again, I think your story is so interesting, but thank you so much for your time today. No problem.